yes, the recording's in progress. If they could only get the guy to speak up, uh, we'd be okay. <laughs> I'm sorry to be a little bit late. Must have been that long-winded homilist they had this morning. Okay. That, uh, I tell you. But it gave uh, some people the opportunity to, you know, pull out their phone, make some, uh, you know, pull their money out of the bank, you know, just to <laughs> save themselves. When you find out the list of uh, yeah, inadequacies of the uh, bank out on the West Coast in Silicon Valley of all places where you have all these geniuses and, uh, and they didn't know how to handle their money, they put it all into things, you know, that would have uh, stuff in, the, uh, maybe if, if we didn't have uh, the economy that we have now, uh, maybe those things would have worked, but they, well, we have this economy we have now and with inflation and things like that, so it doesn't work. Uh, so they, anyway. That's why I never put my millions in that bank. <laughs> I mean, I'm serious. You could call them up and say, did he put any millions in the bank? And they say, no. Yeah. I believe we're on seven and eight today. Is that correct? So we're making uh, good uh, progress here. I'm, I'm getting more and more convinced uh, that uh, the opportunity we have in Holy Week for only for those who are interested, it's not part of our program, but it's a it's a freebie, um, and uh, is uh, how to read one way to read the Gospel of John's infancy narrative, which starts at chapter thirteen and goes up to twenty one. There's two books in John. The first book is the Book of Signs, S I G N S, not miracles because he doesn't use that word. He uses signs because signs point always to something in the future, like a sign can tell you to stop. Or a sign can tell you that down the road is where uh, Starbucks is. So you, you can get signs can point you to things. And that's what these seven signs are. For example, the first one is the wedding feast at Cana. You know, so that's a sign. Well, why is that a sign? Well, because Jesus addresses his mother there as woman. Uh, you would think that's uh, not as homey as it should be. Uh, they, they don't have words for mom then and stuff like that. But because of the fact that she stands for a woman. In other words, she has uh, layers of meaning. Uh, and one layer of that meaning is that uh, Eve was the mother of humankind and Mary is the mother of redeemed kind. In other words, she uh, at the cross uh, is also called woman. That's the only two times she appears in the gospel and both times she's called woman because she has a wider expanse in who she is than just a person uh, in Nazareth or Bethlehem or someplace. So uh, that uh, might help us a little bit. Uh, other signs are like Lazarus. Lazarus is brought out of the tomb. And uh, the uh, effect that that has, because it's the seventh sign, uh, in the prologue it says, Jesus says, I will bring you uh, light and life. So chapter six, we get a man given sight in a miracle of some man getting his sight, he was blind. And seven, we get a man coming out of the tomb who was dead. And you notice in the parable that we have in Luke's gospel is the only parable out of 40 that mentions a name. And that name is Lazarus. And you recall what the story is there? You know, that the rich man is inside dressed in purple and stuff like that. Oh, I'm glad I got my best one off. And, um, uh, so, uh, but the poor man is out there and it's so poor that the dogs eat have come to lick the sores that he has, you know, uh, just that's horrible treatment. However, he's given a name, Lazarus. <laughs> so, you know, uh, you, you have to think that there is some cahoots between the school that put out John's work and the school that put out uh, Luke's work because Luke gets his, he's a, a Gentile, you know, and uh, becomes a, uh, in the second missionary journey of Paul, becomes a follower of Jesus and then stays with Paul and uh, becomes, and there's a beautiful book uh, called The Dear and Glorious Physician. Uh, you might've heard it back in the fifties or so. Uh, and uh, anyway, uh, and it's a very long book, about 600 pages, but the last, you know, 10, 15, 20 pages are of Luke, the gospel writer coming to Mary who is living uh, either in Jerusalem or in Ephesus. And, and he talks with her. Because when you go to the Gospel of Mark, there is no infancy narrative. And uh, although he has access to Mary, he, he wants to get into the action of Jesus. Uh, but Luke wants to show us 
very, very clearly that all of the prophecies and all of the events of, of the birth of Jesus were all accurate and true. And uh, so uh, that's the way he, he uh, comes to it. And it's, and it's a beautiful thing. He, he goes to her home, her little home, and uh, talks with her and stuff. And there's movies made of these kind of things. Uh, so anyway, but the, the uh, chapter 13 starts with the book of glory, not the book of passion, but the book of glory. There is no passion here. There's no uh, ultimate suffering like you have in, uh, in the Garden of Gethsemane. How does Luke have it? Luke is a doctor, so he says he has a subterranean uh, merger of uh, bloodlets inside. As you know, you might not know this, but your arm is filled with uh, love, 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 love blood type things. And uh, doctors will tell you this. And they can just uh, expand and, and come out with the sweat. So what happens with Jesus? He's, he's actually, he's bleeding uh, in, in uh, the Garden of Gethsemane. That's how bad off it was. You know, they, and the Luke is the one who mentions that. The others don't know that. And uh, hepatidrosis is what it's called. And, and uh, so uh, that chapter 13 starts this way. Jesus knew that the hour, see now hour is not TikTok time, but sacred time. The, there's difference between chronos, which is chronology, which is daytime. You know, God, you know we had just uh, last uh, uh, weekend, you know, we had the uh, terrible, wretched thing of losing uh, an hour. You know, what, what the heck is that all about? And uh, so then... Well, it was because the, the you know the the farm kids you know had to adjust their work, yeah. so uh, for picking up the crops, so they needed more time. So anyway, um, Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to lead. In fact, what does he say at uh, the wedding feast of Canaan? His mother says they're out of wine, and he says, "My hour has not yet come." See, so here in chapter thirteen, it comes now. That's the book of glory. And uh, so uh, it is, uh, Jesus says, uh, Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. And he loved his own to the fullest. Now, some people say to the end because they want to put, translate in English. And end for them means the last thing that he did. You know, that's not true. Uh, it's uh, the, the thing is telos in Greek, which is uh, infinity. It, it's time, it's infinity. So he loved them to the fullest. You know, that's, a, that's helpful to know, you know, that, uh, because the, the love of Jesus doesn't go out to them at that moment for the next couple of days, and that's it. it instead, it has just the opposite, which is Jesus is with us all the time and lives through us. Uh, so anyway, that's all happening there. So now we uh, have uh, two chapters today, and both of them are full of material. So uh, when I was saying that the Gospel of John has uh, a, a, a no passion, you would say, well, then how can we have a reading of the passion narrative? Well, you don't. You read the glory narrative, and it has a lengthy sermon in there, if you want, with chapters 13, 14, 15, 16, and 17. And 17 is nice because it ends up in two parts. One is for his disciples, and then for us. <laughs> hey, we get included. So it's, it's not like we're the last, but we built up to be the best. <laughs> there you go. So we represent a 2,000 years of Jesus stuff. Well, let's get into this. Um, 2 Corinthians chapter 7. And I put down here something that uh, a little bit that's uh, somewhat irrelevant. This 2 Corinthians has a section in there where there, it's interrupted by uh, another letter that doesn't get in there. Remember, we were talking about how this letter of second letter, uh, the of of Paul probably had, or the whole first letter, and well, we're on the second letter. We'll have some other uh, letters that were sent out, but never put into this form. So there are some of that, probably maybe even up to five. So since we have these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from every defilement of flesh and spirit, making holiness perfect in the fear of God. Well, once again, we have one of these sentences that just tells you the whole shebang <laughs> of what the cosmos is about. God didn't make the world to have, uh, you know, kind of a, a playpen or something uh, like kids in a sandbox. Uh, he did it so that he could uh, express, I, I use the masculine, so that God could express love outside of the Trinity. You say, well, that's very mysterious. Well, that's true. Uh, all you have to do is pinch yourself and say, what, how did I get here? You say, well, your parents. No, well, yeah, but where'd they come from? 
So yes, okay, all right, you're asking me for a National Geographic picture. All right, I'll do that. So what you can do is you can take the whole globe and spread it out like this, you know, kind of wrap it around so it's now rectangular. And you can take the earliest humans and they come up here out of Africa, then, then they go over to Europe and then they go up and over, and then they come down over the Bering site and they come down to the West Coast. And probably the first, they think, are you ready? The first person to be in the United States was a woman 20 some years old who died in Texas. I think, I don't know, I forgot, uh, 40,000 years ago or something. <laughs> How would they know that? Why yeah. would they say that? Well, there's some real old people around. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they probably remember, you know, well, there's Thanksgiving and Christmas. and. <laughs> Yeah, well, you know, because of the fact that they once they start in on, you know, what these age groups are and stuff like that, they can they can figure from their scientists. So they can figure what these things are from your nowadays from DNA. If you go back 50 years ago, they didn't have DNA. Now, now we have DNA. But they figured that uh, because of the shape of the skull and the shape of the body and stuff like that, and they, they can tell. And then what they did was they took the skull and they uh, and they they put it into the computer and it came out and I'll be, it looks Asian. The face looks Asian. They don't show you the rest of it. It's just their face. It looks Asian. And so they say, then it goes down through Mexico and then all the way down the West coast of South America. And it said, it only took them a couple of hundred years to do that. We're, we're talking about, you know, hundreds of thousands of years and stuff like that. And they said, yeah, so that yeah, anyway, so, I, I think because of her age, she doesn't have to pay taxes. So, uh, anyway, uh, since we have these promises, beloved, what are those promises? Promises are covenants. Let us cleanse ourselves from every defilement. Well, this is certainly a Lenten theme, is it not? I mean, that's all we're doing in Lent is saying, get rid of our sinfulness. Of flesh and spirit. Flesh meaning the body. It doesn't mean something sexual. It means our body. And spirit, which means our soul. So uh, the way that they would kind of look upon humanity, Aristotle would do this, is, is you would have the flesh and the spirit, making holiness perfect in the fear of God. Now, this uh, phrase here uh, is uh, misleading. Uh, fear is to be translated, I'm telling you, in, and should be translated as awe, A-W-E. If you go to Kierkegaard, Kierkegaard, who wrote in the 1840s, great Lutheran, a theologian, and he said, God, and the title of his book was, We Meet Jesus in Fear and Trembling. You know, in other words, well, yes, let's go in, back in the Gospel of John. When the soldiers come out uh, to capture Jesus, who uh, they said, uh, Jesus says, What are you looking for? He says, Jesus. I says, I am Jesus. And one man falls over. Now, now the uh, literary people say that's because he tripped over a root coming out of the ground in uh, the olive orchard because this is the Mount of Olives. Uh, now, okay, are you ready for that? So that's silly. What happens is that's the proper thing for anybody to do before Jesus is to fall down in front of him. So that was what they mean here by fear of God is not like, oh no, I got to hide in the corner and put you know, cloth over me. The Lutherans feel that, you know, that, that we, we, we have a carapace like a turtle. We have something over us and that's the grace of Christ. And that's what saves us. The rest of us is corrupt. Uh, uh, Catholics do not believe, uh, do not go there. That, that's not the case. They should read these things more carefully. The awe of God. So in other words, when we uh, have that uh, intensity that sometimes somewhere uh, we will have a, a sense that I'm not just alone in my life. Some things happen that are really, um, and it's not St. Anthony, you know, finding my wallet. <laughs> but it's Jesus following us. Uh, make room for us. We have not wronged anyone or ruined anyone or taken advantage of anyone. See, now Paul, Paul is, these uh, things I just, I love the way he does these things. He goes down the ladder of things of what they could have done, you know, is come as kind of, kind of authority figures uh, to tell us what to do. And he doesn't do that. He tells us what God tells us to do. I do not say this in condemnation for him. I said that you are in our hearts that we may die together and live together. I just, I don't, I, I, again, now I'm, I'm getting into a, poetry kind of mindset that Paul has said, uh, we are we are together in this. And uh, when he talks about dying, uh, actually, some of the early church is already dying. 
I mean, Paul is writing this uh, probably maybe in the year 56 or so. And so they haven't gone through the Nero time yet, but they have gotten beaten up by the Jews and uh, the uh, other uh, apostles are out in uh, diaspora. They're all over the place. Uh, so uh, verse 41, I have great confidence in you. I have great pride in all of you. I am filled with encouragement. I am overflowing with joy, all the more because of all our affliction. Well, let's go over that again, because is this not exactly the reason why these fake people, you know, the super apostles come along? That's why they're fake, is because they will not suffer for Jesus. You say, well, that sounds cruel. No, it's the reality. Our world, I mentioned today, is, is up for grabs in terms of going after the church. As I, I mentioned, if you, if you, the one gentleman was uh, uh, pushing back because some guy was going after his son because they were outside of an abortion uh, clinic. And uh, so they, uh, they arrested him and they went before the judge and just says, that is not a crime. And so that was that. So it was over until uh, you know, a change of uh, mindset comes in and the Department of Justice, which means the FBI comes out because of this little push the guy had to stay away from my child. And, uh, and, and, and then, you know, he's going to be in jail for 30 years. And they, they came with rifles and they pull him out of the house so that the capture of him and put the, you know, bracelets on him and stuff is all done in front of his family. They have seven kids. So the, now that's, why is that? It was in Pennsylvania. Why did they do that? Well, because they're Catholic and they were protesting the abortion clinic. So just like we have it here where people stand, you know, on the cross the way on the sidewalk and they have prayers and they have other things. and sometimes people are saved from that. They just say, you know, I just don't want to do this abortion. So let's help you. So, but the, this, now can you imagine that the United States government takes all that effort uh, to come out and to arrest a person in a terrible way and then to uh, lock them up and, uh, and put them in jail for, like I say, 30 years. Why? Because of the fact that he violated the law, which is you are not to interfere with people going into the abortion clinic. So anyway, uh, and, and you say, well, that's just one single example. No, there, there's the things like that taking place all over. It says, uh, so uh, anyway, Paul talking, he says, because of our affliction, I should have underlined that four lines under. See, why? Because our affliction is that we're ready to stand up for Christ. If you were at Mass today, we had a reading from the book of Daniel and where Daniel's uh, uh, in, ba in Babylon and uh, he, is don he interpreted some dreams for the king there. And so uh, he uh, was so uh, good to the king uh, that the king appointed him with three of his Jewish henchmen to govern areas like uh, small vi villages of the Jews that were in captivity up in Babylon. When we say captivity, we don't mean that they were being harshly treated or whipped or anything like that. We mean that they are going to be in that area. They can't go back uh, to their homeland, et cetera. So anyway, uh, so they're, uh, they're uh, then the, the king makes a statue and the statue has four levels to it. He doesn't know it, but Daniel does. But anyway, and, and, and what it tells is that, that that group of people in Babylon are going to be done. <laughs> so anyway, uh, but they, they take the three because they won't bow down in worship of the stone or copper or uh, whatever it was, it was, different parts of the body, different parts of things, and, uh, and wouldn't worship it. And so they threw them into this fire, this giant kiln that they had and they danced around it meanwhile the three guys who put them in there were roasted uh, to ashes and so they, the king says man be sure that it's seven times as much heat going in there as we pour he keeps throwing logs in there charcoal and stuff and uh, so they come out and then uh, he is totally a, a, a gog at that and uh, so th this this kind of thing that goes on is that uh, you know they were willing to do this just because they were asked to uh, give up their life for Yahweh. And uh, they, uh, they, so anyway. Now, what I put down here is this various themes. I says uh, themes, uh, that is transition to the next section. See that what's the next section? Paul's joy in Macedonia. Now, when he gets to Macedonia, what's he going to talk about? Confidence and pride, encouragement, joy and affliction. All these things, see, are kind of uh, elements of the way that they have lived now and are going off to Macedonia. Macedonia, of course, is, is Greece. This is where they're going to. For even when we came into Macedonia, our flesh had no rest, but we were afflicted in every way, 
external conflicts, internal fears. It couldn't be said better that, you know, how, how, how would you like to have these type of things go on? How would you like to be there about this thing that was in Pennsylvania and have yourself arrested and put into, a, a, you know, a handcuffs and put into a police car for the FBI of putting your dad away because of this incident? And you say, oh, my God, you know, this, this stuff's going on in our country. And uh, so anyway, uh, and all of this, of course, is with the approval. You wouldn't get that kind of thing. I mean, if somebody called the FBI and complained about it, stuff like that, uh, they say, no, that those were the orders that came down to us. Why else would they do that? Usually what they do is call the guy up and say, come down to our office because we have to de- get this thing cleared up. And that would have taken care of it. So let's continue. I've already talked too much on that. But God who encourages the downcast encouraged us by the arrival of Titus. Say, hey, boy, Paul really trusts his lieutenants, doesn't he? <laughs> He's got Titus and Timothy and a bunch of others, Priscilla and Aquila. And it says, not only by his arrival, but also by the encouragement with he was encouraged in regard to you, as he told us of your yearning, your lament, your zeal for me, so that I rejoiced even more. In other words, they're saying, uh, they're yearning for Paul, uh, but for who Paul is, and that is Paul is the evangelical, evangelical that God has chosen to spread the word. So that's what they mean. They don't mean that, you know, they're in, in uh, great admiration of Paul, of course. But, uh, but it has the qualities to it. Uh, and zeal, uh, zeal, remember uh, uh, Elijah has zeal. Zelo, what does he say, uh, Elijah? Zelo zelatasum. Zelo zelatasum. For with zeal, I'm a zealous uh, for the uh, being of God. Zelo zelatasum. From Deo gratias. So you see that in windows and stuff in Carmelite churches. So I rejoiced even more. For even if I saddened you by my letter, that what letter was that? First Corinthians, remember? <laughs> the whole first part of it goes after me. Um, but because you were saddened into repentance, ah, so he says it was good you were sad. Yeah, I should have sent you some Kleenex uh, because they should be crying over all the rotten stuff you were doing. And because of that, uh, now uh, they uh, repent. For you were saddened in a godly way. So that you did not suffer loss in anything because of us. Why would that be? Well, because God is not an eternal forebearer of your inadequacy as a human being. I'll repeat that. God does not look down upon you and say, never more am I going to pay attention to you. Instead, God would say just the opposite, which is you are in need of wholesomeness. And I can give you that through grace. And I will give it to you through the church and reading of scripture and in communion. So you were saddened into repentance in a godly way so that you did not suffer loss in anything because of us. For godly sorrow produces a salutary repentance without regret, but worldly sorrow produces death. This worldly sorrow produces death. Okay, I uh, agree with you because you're saying, you know, we have an example of that. In Matthew's gospel, what's the example we have there? Peter. What does Peter do that is the ultimate sin? He doesn't know Jesus. Remember that? Three times over, he says, I don't know who you're talking. And the third time, he even slaps his hand and swears. And, and remember what Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount? Uh, well, if you swear, which means take an oath, you got to be honest to it. You can't say yes and then no, and then yes and no, and yes and no, no. If you say yes, it's yes. If it's no, it's no. So what's happening is that Peter makes the oath that Jesus, he doesn't know. Now, what, let's go back to this sentence here. He says, if you were saddened in a godly way, so you did not suffer loss in anything because of us, for godly sorrow produces salutary repentance. Well, isn't that what happened to Peter? Eventually, Yes. Let's, okay, let's, oh, oh, yeah, I, I see, yes, 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 oh, yes, yes. Uh, well, one more has just joined us now, yes, okay. It's a, like TV. Uh, yeah, how, how about uh, how about the uh, Gospel of John chapter 21? Jesus, Peter, do you love me? Peter says, yes, I, I love you, but he doesn't use a strong word for love. So Jesus says again, Peter, do you love me? Yes, I love you. But he doesn't use a strong language there. So Jesus gives in. 
we don't know this because three we, our reading of it is three times over he says i love you i love you i love you but there's two different words for love and the third one is agape and agape is i will give my life for you and so as jesus asked the third time does he use agape no why because peter's already shown that he doesn't understand it so what does jesus do he tells him better understand this because there will come a time when they will take you where you do not want to go see in other words and we know what that means that peter will be taken outside the city and crucified upside down do you see how this fits together so you see what what uh, paul is talking about here now he's not talking about this in this language because we're, we have the uh, benefit of the of the gospels which started in the year 70. so don't think that we're talking about you know the knowledge about all the stuff that came afterwards but this is what Paul is telling us right now. He produces salts. It says, without regard for worldly sorrow produces death. Now, do we have an example of that in the Gospel of Matthew? Uh, you know, well, this is great. Uh, it was 100%. Yes. Uh, it's terrific. Good for you. Uh, Judas. Why did, why did Judas commit suicide? Because he was afraid of Jesus. And? Remorse. and couldn't get remorse why couldn't he get remorse because he didn't open his soul to it if peter does the ultimate crime you know in in spirituality of saying i don't even know jesus with an oath and judas uh, comes along now there's whole books written on all this there's one book i i had from a jewish rabbi who said that uh judas was a hero a Jewish hero. Why is that? Because he was the one person who saw through Jesus to the chicanery that he was, and he might have done miracles and signs, but he wasn't Yahweh to us. Uh, so, and anyway, uh, so but yeah, so Judas, yes, Judas is uh, is. Do you see? Do you see what that balance is? You know, you have one person who accepts forgiveness and another person who can't and therefore dies. Uh, that's the under. Now. Uh, shall we return to the Passion Play in Ober Amargao this last year in the summertime, uh, about three times a week, uh, and a, a person with, you know, stamina and, uh, and money uh, could afford to take his sister to see it? Yes, yes, I remember that. Yes. Yeah. She's a lovely person. She taught for 40 years. She taught a second grade in Catholic grade school. And she had, a, you know, she could have done anything. She had a master's and stuff from Auburn. So anyway, um, yeah, so she saw it. Then she went home, and then I, I got to see it two more times because they, the second time I went down there, I think I told you this, they only had one ticket left. I said, do you have any more tickets, you know, possibly? Because I had been with the Carmelite sisters up at Dachau because we had mass together. And then uh, then I, I jumped in my car. Instead of going into uh, the uh, Chinese tower in the English garden to have a beer, <laughs> excuse me i'm sorry <laughs> i got in my car and did a, a you know a decent pace uh, in other words i flew by all the other cars and got to Oberammergau, and i uh, literally ran across the uh, the small village there uh, the major block downtown where they had the kiosk that was selling tickets so you have to get your tickets two years ahead of time stuff like that so anyway uh so i went up and says would you by any chance have a, 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 any tickets left she says we have one <laughs> so, so she's as she's as she's telling me yes there's one now yes there's one now between there is one had between those letters a giant chasm of emptiness which i filled with 20 year old pieces and i got the ticket and then she says i think you're gonna like this ticket why was that Fifth row. <laughs> you know, if, if this was, you know, the, the theater, which would be like a slant, like a movie theater, stuff like that. You know, and so it holds 470 people. So, and there, there I was in the middle, fifth row. Hi, everybody. <laughs> so anyway. Did I ever tell you about that poor guy who was in a movie theater and uh, and he, he, he was like crashed out or something like that. He was in great pain and he was crashed out in one of the seats there and he's bothering everybody. So they got the, you know, usher to come by and he couldn't move and he's crying and stuff. So they finally got the police and the police came in and they weren't going to be friendly. This guy's moaning and groaning and stuff like that. They says, 
Okay, pal, it says, where'd you come from? He says, the balcony. <laughs> it's just a story here. <laughs> okay, so let's uh, continue here. So I rejoice now, not because you were saddened, but because you were saddened into repentance. Uh, verse 11. For behold, what earnestness this godly sorrow has produced for you, as well as readiness for a defense and indignation and fear and yearning and zeal and punishment, in every way you've shown yourselves to be innocent in the matter. In other words, they have given, they have been given in their heart a, 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 a grace that was beyond what they had for their sin. Let me think that through again. They did a sin that was so much so that they got in trouble with them. But the rest of the community who were pure, holy, and everything else. So, so they were against that. But now what they get is a greater resolve and love for Christ that they might not, that they didn't have before. Does that make sense? In other words, what happened is out of this correction, uh, they became holier. So in a way, you might say to yourself, was that a terrible thing that happened in their sinfulness? Yes, it was. But because of the fact that God's grace then intervened in this theme of repentance, they are made whole again. Uh, how else could you express uh, the church over 2,000 years finally developing what confession was? And uh, they finally, after the Council of Trent, got a lot of things organized that before were kind of like local things to do. And now they got things that are so. He says, so he says, uh, so verse 12. So even though I wrote to you, it was not on account of the one who did the wrong or on account of the ones who suffered the wrong. See, now, oh, now, now <laughs> we'd have to go back to letter one and to read it. And you can be sure that Paul was going after these people. <laughs> Uh, but now what is he saying? He says, well, I, yeah, I, I should tell you now the secret to it all. I wasn't going after it because I, I you know, hated him. It seemed like that because I kicked him out. He says, but I wanted to emphasize their perfidy. So instead what he said, he says, uh, I, uh, he says, we rejoice even more because of the joy since his spirit has been refreshed. And says, uh, then for if I have boasted to him about you, it was not put, I was not put to shame. No, just as everything we said to you was true, so our boasting before Titus proved to be the truth. See, why? Because now they were made plain in the sight of God in verse 12. See, that in verse 12, now they, uh, now they belong again because they've made their confession. So they suffered the wrong and it got them into the glory of the right. So joy, love, and relief. And his heart goes out to you all the more as he remembers the obedience of all of you when you received him without, with fear and trembling. Well, I, I mentioned Kierkegaard there just in case I forgot that it was written in 1843. <laughs> Rejoice because I have confidence in you in every respect. I have degrees in philosophy, so and Kierkegaard came up in one of them. Existentialism, people like that in the 50s. So now we're on the next page, I believe. Or is there some kind of a mix up on this? I think so. The yes. Yeah. 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 You're, you're right. Uh, and that was a uh, printing it when it was put into the uh, Xerox and stuff like that. It was because um, they they printed this for us down at uh, St. Raphael's, and also it was done by FedEx, I think. And they gave us a great break. Uh, but yeah, so this is a uh, this is something here. Uh, so let's uh, let's uh, hold that page off for a little bit, and let's instead go to. Well, let's go to the page that I have about Rome. Okay, it's the uh, you know page of extra information. I, I, let's read through this real quick. It says first ever scientific test on what we believe to be the remains of the Apostle Paul seems to confirm 
that they do belong to the Roman Catholic Saint, Pope Benedict the 16th said Sunday. So that was in our, in this, in this time zone, uh, in this time zone, we uh, have now said to Paul, because a Peter was discovered, if I have the, I don't have the exact date, but Peter was discovered in the 30s, but it took him up to the 90s to make it uh, confirmed. That's because there was some snotty Monsignor who felt that he should be in charge of this whole thing. Whereas there was a genius, a woman who was an archeologist and she could show you all the time, all the stuff that was way down at the bottom, you know, and stuff like the, on the wall here, there would be a sign that says, here is Peter and there'd be an arrow. <laughs> so then you get walk down the wall and you see kind of a strange brick there that is not there in some other place, you know, and that's, and, and so they, and they have that Latin, Picus Petrus, you know, here is Peter. So and that, that's pretty good. So then they open it up and they pull, so they don't pull his bones out. They do stuff because of the, the weight of the ages and stuff like that has impressed itself on him. But they do then declare that this is the place of Peter. And strange, and not strangely enough, but realistically enough, that when they started to build St. Peter's, which was like in the 500s or so, because remember the, the Roman Empire lasted up through the 300, stuff like that, persecuting Christians. So later on, they start to build this great church. Then they, they will build a final version of it in the, in the 1500s. And they will have Michelangelo and all these other great people that uh, put beauty into this thing. You know, the great, uh, the, the great uh, cupola that they have over the top of the altar. And then down below that is where this burial spot is. So they've got that all figured out that that's where uh, Peter was now. Uh, with, the next thing was Paul. So you could pretty well figure, let's go back to the same routine that Paul would not be buried, you know, down the road or something like that. He would be buried at the spot where uh, he was executed. And that became a spot for early churches. Now that was outside of uh, Rome itself. So what you could do is you could build places there a lot easier. Uh, so let's continue to read here. He says, the second major discovery concerning St. Paul announced by the Vatican in its many days. On Saturday, the Vatican newspaper, uh, Zeratorio Romano, announced the June 19th discovery of a fresco inside another tomb depicting St. Paul, which Vatican officials said represented the oldest known icon of the apostle. Oh, we're getting closer here. Benedict said that the archaeologist recently unearthed and opened the white marble sarcophagus located under the Basilica of St. Paul's outside the walls of Rome. And for some 2,000 years, it had been believed by the faithful to be the tomb of St. Paul. Benedict says scientists had condu uh, conducted carbon dating tests on bone fragments uh, found inside the sarcophagus and affirmed that that date from the first or second century. Now, we had the question before, how do you know about these uh, dates and things like that? Well, they have that. You know, th this is exactly what they were doing. Remember uh, back in 1979, they asked for a uh, view of the Shroud of Turin. And they said it was fake uh, because the, the cloth that they uh, had uh, discovered or uh, used uh, was uh, the type of cloth they had back in the 13th century. So that's what they figured. Now, everybody that had knew anything in depth about this would squirm and yell and stuff like that. Uh, I myself had studied the Trout of Turin uh, for, uh, let's see what time that was, in 79, uh, for 25 years. I had the book, you know, Dr. Calvary, you know, which explained how the shroud was put together and the suffering of Jesus. That was written by a doctor from France and stuff. And uh, so what, what happened there was uh, they, they came and they, and that cloth was folded up over, like, you know, folded, 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 and put it into a silver coffin-like thing. And then they had a fire in France in the church it was in. And it hit a, a corner of it. And that corner of it then burnt itself into the cloth. So that when you opened it up, you had, and you can see this because I have a copy of that up on the wall upstairs. Yes. Who else would think about putting a copy up there? I just, um, once again, an explosion of ego. See, I'm getting my, I, I'm getting my uh, things. I'm getting my, my little uh, thing of the jigs to sew me up up here. Uh, this afternoon uh, and so I, i'm expecting some kind of a large explosion of hot air you know, <laughs> these doctors are going to be really amazing so i says don't worry it's happened before so um anyway but but uh, the, the, what they did was a uh when they studied it 
because uh, some nuns, by the way, were the ones who sewed in patches, you know, but they're not going to go to the patches. So they, they, but they wouldn't let him take anything that was near the body or near the blood that was in the uh, cloth. Later they did, and they found out that that was very similar to the very things that are in these churches that had, you know, the liquid blood and stuff. They all had the same blood type, and that was in the cloth. And uh, there was, see, uh, on the back of the Shroud of Turin, across your buttocks here at the top, uh, that would be kind of like a little river could go through there. So you saw all the way across the bottom here, you saw a little tributary of, of blood coming across. And uh, so what they did was they took, uh, they were supposed to have five pieces of the cloth, but not pieces as much as threads. So they took three of the threads and they used that for this test to find out it was 1200 something. Then they decided nobody in has told us how that image got on the cloth. They say, well, it wasn't painted. Oh, well, then it wasn't, you know, splashed on. How did it get in there? You know, that's the, the question of all time. And you know who came up with the answer? National Review, the Catholic conservative magazine, had an article on it and said, we think we found out the reason for this because they went to Japan and they noticed that uh, the atomic bomb had uh, a picture of somebody standing like this. And the car uh, was over here, a metal car, of course, and he was standing here. And so when the explosion came, it came right through him, but it put a shadow on the car. Does that make sense? It was the shadow was the, uh, the radiation. The radiation is what did it. So uh, they concluded in this National Review article that it was, this is what happened to Jesus. There, there's no way that you can paint that on there. There's no way that you could use tea bags or something and make, you know, images like that. There's no way that you could get that in there. And it's not, it's not something that's on the threads, but it's in the threads. And it, so you can't go into a loom and put all the stuff that's there for the shroud. It's, it's impossible. So what their conclusion could be uh, very well is that at the moment of resurrection, remember it said that the, the stone rolled out and psh, and Jesus rose from the dead. So that, that could very well be it. If you want to put it into human um, anatomical events, it was radiation. So wh why am I talking about all this? Well, be just because we're interested. Well, I'm interested in this, and I hope you do too. So, so uh, let's go down about four. It says, Benedict, the scientists conduct carbon dating. So now what they did was they, they did a second uh, review of all this. They took the Air Force uh, machines from uh, New Mexico, and they put the shroud in that, and they did a, a electronic seeing of things that were in the cloth. And that's how they developed a three-dimensional image, because they took the kind of like the photographic material, and they put it onto something, and it gave a three-fold uh, thing. And you know, if you go to uh, the, the uh, shroud, <clears throat> which is not on display, uh, I, I saw it when in 2014, and, uh, but anyway, what they will have is uh, a museum, uh, like a mile away. And they had, when you walk in, they have a, like a corpse as it would look like in a, a shroud. So in other words, three-dimensional. It was like, you know, something made out of plastic or something like that. But very, very intriguing. You're, you're really kind of sensing this is something very mm, touches your soul because here you're seeing the body of Christ as it would be in three, the actual body in it in the shroud so uh that's what they're thinking so uh, this seems to confirm that these are the uh, mortal remains of apostle paul benedict said i'm keeping going down there paul and peter two main figures known for spreading christian faith according to tradition saint paul was beheaded in rome the pope says the archaeologist i'm just going down there open sarcophagus saturday vatican newspaper the fresco and gold enabled the emaciated face of paul then discovered in excavation of the tomb of saint tecla in rome it was believed to have been dated to the end of the fourth century, make it the oldest known icon of Paul, meaning it was an image designed by prayer, not just art. In other words, it was a painting. See, if you went into the uh, catacombs, that's where you would find paintings of saints. So anyway, uh, it says Vatican archaeologists in 2002 began excavating the tomb of St. Paul, which goes to 390, buried under the main altar. And they went through this top of the coffin has small openings and covered with mortar because, okay, the basilica stands in the fourth century. Well, okay, you can just continue to read it. So what they're doing is they're giving you by this uh, thing here. This was published in 2009. 
by the Associated Press. Yes. Well, I saved this particular page just in case, you know, in 2023, uh, some people would want to find out about it. You got to have foresight. That's, you know. Well, let's uh, continue now. And we'll move to chapter nine. And chapter nine again seems to have fallen. They say actual carbon dating now has the shroud to within the second century. Yes, and, exactly. And it's the margin of error. Yes, absolutely. Yes, because now they were able to take a, a larger. See, they, nobody wants to cut into it. <clears throat> but when you start using some uh, photographic imagery and other type things, there's possibility. Also, even if he just took a corner, because you don't know if, if some of these <clears throat> things that were sewed on there, yeah. you know, because of the uh, fire. <clears throat> for example, there's, there's as the body lays uh, with, uh, back on the shroud and the front comes down, there are no feet on the front. They're only on the back. And it's very interesting when you take a look at it that, that the... Uh, the feet are not like, you know, parallel like this. One of the one of the foot is up like this, something like this, you know. So anyway, it's it. Oh, here here to be like this, it'd be like this was uh, you know kind of like frozen in there, like a you know like um, some kind of a muscle type thing. Why would that be? Well, because possibly because you got the foot over the other foot. Uh, you see some of that crucifixions where a knee will go through both feet. Other ones, if they wanted you to last for a long time, just in pain, they would put a board underneath so you could stand on it. But here you have the full weight of this. That's why in the Shroud of Turin, uh, when they talked about the uh, Jesus in the in this Dr. Calvary type thing, he took, because he was a surgeon, he had access to some limbs. So he took a limb and he put the nail through here, and then he put a 60-pound a brick down here and just pulled right through. So that's when we get the change, you know, that this was in the dust bowl space in your wrist. And uh, so, uh, so, yeah, so th these type things. The next thing they found in the last uh, 25 years is botany. Uh, through careful vacuuming, they have found uh, not, not full seeds, but they found a detritus that comes from the very types of flowers and stuff like that, that they had between Jerusalem and um, the Herodian, which is down the road there. So, well, let's uh, continue now. We got chapter nine. <laughs> eight, chapter eight. We're going to do chapter eight um, because I uh, I want to back up uh, from chapter nine. <laughs> Here, Bishop, he seems to have lost it. Uh, <laughs> point. I got the prophetic. I'm okay. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, here it was 2009, but I thought about this article coming here. So, <laughs> generous in giving, want you to know that this has been given to the churches of Macedonia. Now, you see what he's talking about here is, and uh, we might not have the same uh, perception of it, but I, I think it's very necessary to do it. What happens is Paul is very careful now to support the church in Jerusalem. Because what has happened there is this. Now we are in the 50s, remember, and that means that Paul is, uh, you know, going to be going uh, into uh, uh, be into uh, Jerusalem at the end of that decade and into the beginning of the next decade. Now, the fire in Rome was in the year 64, and so Paul was probably killed along with Peter in uh, 60, 66, and. Uh, that's most likely 64 to 66, somewhere in that time zone. So this letter is written you know, before all that. But however, they still have the fact that Paul was converted. And I'm gonna throw out a date here that we don't know exactly. I'll, I'll go to the year 32 or so, uh, maybe even 33. It wouldn't be 31. Jesus died April the 7th in the year 30. And uh, so according to our the calendar that we would be using, and according to that calendar, Jesus was born four years before Christ because of the fact that Herod, uh, the great Herod, Herod the Great, died 
uh, in year four, and that was the year that Jesus was born. So they know that. Now, how did that happen? Well, because of the fact that they changed some of these calendars in the Middle Ages, and it was usually done by monks. And there was one monk who wanted to make a new calendar and trace everything back, all the way back to the birth of Jesus. But he got stuck on this whole thing about the fact that uh, Herod the Great uh, was there in the calendar at the time that they were using. So they moved everything back. So it's complicated, but uh, eventually what, what happens is uh, the, the, the calendar is valid. You just have to know that it was valid. <laughs> so uh, it wasn't someone made a mistake. It was that they were correcting what they thought it was uh, because <clears throat> one thing <clears throat> might help you a little bit <clears throat> where the Romans had at the end of the year, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, a two week uh, no time, a dies non, uh, an empty day. And it was, people went wild. And that's because the, the calendar <clears throat> was based on the moon uh, for the Jews and perhaps for the sun for the others. And so it would, they would make a, a calendar for the year and stuff like that, but it didn't always come out the same way that they wanted it to. And so they ended up with a time there that they just didn't know how to match it up with. If we're gonna do weeks, then we don't get enough for this. So anyway, they had some wild times. So that could be a part, part of this uh, program as well. Anyway, uh, let's uh, continue. So uh, what Paul's uh, concern is this, if, if you go to the year, let's say 35, to 40 maybe even. See, he didn't do his first missionary journey to 49. That's when he was really kicking into action. But uh, what, what had happened was that the pe Jews from that time on who had converted to Christianity and wanted to stay in Jerusalem were considered to be traitors. Why? Because, well, you've given up your heritage. It goes all the way back to David and Moses and Abraham. You've given that up to follow this man who was crucified. If a man is crucified, he's a zero. Uh, so you, and so they, they they were hurt, and how are they going to live? You know, you just can't go back to to work in the city or things like that. So they were kind of uh, pillaged a little bit. So they needed to have, uh, you know, and that's where Antioch came in. Antioch shipped money down there. So Paul was on his journey, which was out, you know, and this is his second journey, and uh, so he's out here, and he's going to make a collection and and take it back. And uh, in this. Uh, journey that he has going back, uh, sadly, is where he gets uh, arrested. So, and, and the people that started this was Titus. You might have noticed that the title I had on one of these pages was, Hooray for Titus. <laughs> Good for him. Because he, he started, as soon as he found out this is what Paul wanted, uh, he beat Paul to it, started going around taking up collection. And they, they did have, uh, according to uh, time zones, by the time Julius Caesar came around, they were making coins. And these coins would have a face like of Caesar or other people on it. So it would be like we have, you know, Abraham Lincoln or something. And um, so uh, they would have coins and that would be a way in which you could bring stuff, you know, because otherwise, how are you going to bring hay or uh, flowers or other type things? So you could put this. So anyway, uh, and um, the parables of Jesus mentioned these coins. So... Uh, Remember, he says, render unto Caesar. What is Caesar? You know, well, that's where this, this kind of coin came from. So uh, what we're, we're dealing with then is uh, charity and charity to people who are being oppressed. And uh, so, and, and they have their families there, see, and you have your heritage. So all this, so he says, he says, for verse two, in a severe test of affliction, <laughs> the abundance of their joy and their profound poverty overflowed in a wealth of generosity on their part. For according to their means, I can testify and beyond their means spontaneously, they begged us insistently for the favor of taking part in the service to the Holy One. Isn't that fantastic? Uh, I'm sure that uh, Bishop uh, Hicks is uh, into this modality of asking the people of the Diocese of Joliet <clears throat> because we have some 30 different agencies that we support <clears throat> through the church. And we bought that area along Weber Road, uh, which was an old shopping center stuff. I made that, you know, the headquarters of our stuff. So all this requires money. Uh, we have another one, I think, believe it's right down the road here. Uh, you know, a, an office that's up in our area, just an office. And, and so all this has to be taken care of. I mean, when people come in and say, uh, you know, we're, we're absolutely broken and, and uh, we need to get counseling or help or this, that, the other thing, um, you know, they're, they're, we're there to help. <clears throat> 
So he says, according to their means, I can testify beyond their means. Spontaneously, they beg insistently for the favor. So, isn't that beautiful, <laughs> the way they're putting it? So, you know, they say, those people are in need. Oh, I wish we could do it. You know, count on us because, you know, the other cities are doing it, but we want, you know, to be ourselves. Uh, we got to do that. People helped us at the time we needed. We couldn't. So and we urge Titus that it has already, had already begun. He should also uh, complete you know, this gracious act for you. So Paul is very pleased. Uh, and, and it takes up two uh, chapters of this letter of, of Paul. It, it says, now as you excel in every respect, in faith, discourse, knowledge, all earnestness, and in the love we have for you, may excel in this gracious act also. So you can see all this stuff is bubbling over uh, with love and care and respect. For you know the gracious act of our Lord Jesus Christ, that for your sake he became poor, although he was rich, so that by his poverty, you might become rich. Isn't that fantastic? This is Paul at his best. He's doing this all the time now, it seems, making these metaphors kind of going into, you know, richness is not in money. It's in the quality of life that you live because you are in Jesus. Before you were empty and now you are full of grace. So uh, these are the type of things, you know, and so money is just a kind of a sample of that. So uh, he's not talking about economics here. He's talking about the fact that your very desire to be so much a part of this on your own. And then Titus comes along and kind of solidifies that is beautiful. That's why I put down there heavy words. It says, I'm giving counsel on this matter. For it's appropriate for you to be good not only to act, but to act willingly last year. Complete it now so that your eager willingness, look at that, eager willingness, may be matched by your completion of it out of what you have. For if the eagerness is there, it is acceptable according to what one has, not according to what one does not have. Not that others should have relief while you are a burden, but as a matter of equality, our surplus at the present time should supply their needs so that their surplus may also supply your needs, that there may be equality. So the Wall Street Journal yesterday had an article about 15% of the blue states who are rich. That'd be like uh, Massachusetts, uh, uh, California for sure. Other states, you know, that had a lot of money. And they're all fleeing because the taxes are so burdensome. And so uh, what they're actually, uh, the previous mayor, two mayors ago, had to go out and beg people who were rich to come back to New York City because we need your taxes. Not realizing that when they left to go to Florida, it was because they were being taxed too much. And uh, so, uh, uh, and, uh, so anyway, I don't want to get too much into that. But they're saying now that 15% of those people are, are, have been left in the last couple of years, left their blue states you know, with all the wealth because they're being taxed too much. So they wanted to have them come back. And um, they, they were saying that uh, uh, people deliberately now are making their choices on the fact that uh, the two years ago, California had a surplus. This year, they're $2 billion in debt. So, whereas it's the uh, United States, well, we're only, what, $31 trillion in debt. So, oh, 31.4. 31.4, yeah. Well, that's since yesterday. Whoa. <laughs> <laughs> and what is it that each one of us owes? About 260000 Yeah, so every so, taxpayer owes that. Yes. And then the family is, is another one. Yeah. yeah. And the individual is, I think every individual holds about 90 or 100,000. That's every baby, mm. every, you know, yeah. but every taxpayer, about yeah. 270,000 yeah. in debt. Like yeah. that. Well, thank God we have great grandchildren because if we didn't yeah. have great grandchildren, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I know they're going to be shafted. Now. They're just going to, well, that, that's, that's how so many of those uh, communist countries collapsed. Uh, economically is because it went into poverty is precisely because they hear Sweden and Norway and other things are running a system and people say, well, that's socialist. Well, it's not, it's not socialism. They have, they have a high uh, health element, but the rest is all capitalism because you know, that's how you get your money to pay for all that other stuff. So anyway, not, not that I'm you know, one way or another. <laughs> Excuse me. 
So, as it is written, whoever had much, he says, our surplus at present time should supply their needs. Our parish here alone, you maybe you don't know about it because we didn't advertise it, but our parish here alone made a contribution to the Mideast when they had the first of that heavy uh, earthquake, just because, you know, there's no Catholics there, there's no Christians there, but we just felt that uh, we could help some way. Others would want to help some way too. So you're not left alone. You know, you, these are people. And uh, they said now uh, that they have about 300 babies that nobody can claim because maybe the parents are probably dead. So they don't know what to do. Uh, how do you, how do you, you know, that means you got to have diapers and food and milk and all that kind of stuff, take care of these kids. And, and they're all just, they're greatly in need of you know, help. Whoever had much did not have more. Whoever had little did not have less. Titus and his collaborators, but thanks be to God who put the same concern for you in the heart of Titus, for he not only welcomed our appeal, but since he was very concerned, he had gone to you out of his own accord. Now this is uh, uh, the stuff here. You can see here, it um, possibly goes to chapter nine in our book. Well, um, so what do you think? Uh, I, I think we have the gist of what is happening here. I apologize for this printing, but this printing took place last August. Uh, so that well, we've got the last verses on our page. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. I don't. I don't have my book open because I. So you say what? Where should we go to? The next page is there's still. Oh, okay. Yes, excuse me. Is this uh, 19? Does it have 19 at the top? Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, let's take, so this is what we should be yeah. taking to finish off this. Yes. Right. I got you. Everybody with us here? Okay. Well, yeah, everybody is here except the one, you know, <laughs> person who didn't know what was going on. You know? it says, with him, we have sent the brother who is praised in all the churches. <clears throat> now, it's not his biological brother, but his brotherhood in the Christ <laughs> for his preaching of the gospel. So, Titus is out there preaching the gospel already. Now, th now this is, uh, again, we're in, the, in a time zone. Uh, you know, in the 50s. And by the time the year 100 comes around, uh, Titus and Timothy have both been made bishops, uh, Bishop of Cyprus and a Bishop of uh, um, the other island out there. So, oh, excuse me, uh, uh, Ephesus, Ephesus and Cyprus. And not only that, but he's also appointed our traveling companion by the churches in this gracious work administered for us for the glory of the Lord himself and for the expression of our eagerness. The other day it was mentioned about Therese of Lisieux, how there was one nun in her convent, this is a well-known story, uh, who was obnoxious and probably due to age and infirmity. And uh, she saw in that eventually a perfect opportunity to show love. And so we're looking for ways because everybody seemed to be so, you know, friendly and uh, I don't want to say workaholics, but they all all did knew what they had to do and all that. And so this was a case where she could really show love, and she did. So that that be, that became the title of her material there. Uh, you know, the, the little way, you know, is the way to get to salvation. That's what made her so popular. You might want to know that in September we are going to get some relics from Saint Therese, and they're going to come here for the shrine uh, they did that some years ago and they said that they went to the police there and said we need some extra awareness the fact that there's going to be people coming in large numbers and they said oh forget it you know that's a church thing you know i think they had 10 to fifteen thousand or something you know, just in a couple of days which is good because uh, they don't know it yet but i'm going to set up a good parking arrangement <laughs> <laughs> How do you think I can go to Dunkin' Donuts? But 
although although I, I have wonderful friends, <laughs> wonderful friends. Right. So it's not only that, but he's been appointed our traveling companion by the churches in this gracious work administered for us. Now notice, see, you see these phrases, they sneak up on us, on churches, see, because ever since Antioch, when they first used the word church for the collectivity of the people that are there and stuff, they don't have church buildings, they don't have church places, they have perhaps caves or people's homes and stuff, and they had it for 300 years, but, but notice how they say churches. Be, be careful, that it's not a, a churches of different types, but churches. And, uh, and not only that, but he has been appointed our traveling companion by the churches. See, yeah, what a beautiful title. And says this, we desire to afford that anyone blame us about the lavish gift administered by us, for we are concerned for what is honorable, not only in the sight of the Lord, but also in the sight of others. And with them, we have sent our brother, whom we have often tested many ways and found earnest, but who is now much more earnest because of his great confidence in you. So this is all positive, is it not? As for Titus, he is my partner and co-worker for you. As for our brothers, they are apostles of the churches, the glory of Christ. So give proof before the churches of your love and of your boasting about you to them. He's calling all this issue comes up again. They're boasting. Why? Because that they're so generous and all that kind of stuff. No, because they're so much in love with taking care of people and doing the right thing and going on. That's beautiful. Well, we will continue. We're moving right along. Does anybody have any observations they'd like to make or questions or thoughts? Well, verse 15 sounds rather Marxist. Uh, would you read it for us, please? As it is written, whoever had much did not have more, and whoever had less uh -huh. did not have less. Well, April's coming up, isn't it? <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> See, that's for those of you who pay taxes. <laughs> Although the threat is out, the threat is out there. It's gonna, it's, it's not sticking, but it's out there all over the place that churches should be taxed because of the fact they're interfering with our secular uh, culture. So, but they tax the churches; they should tax the clinics too because they're a not-for-profit and according to the tax laws you only have to pay about six percent oh. of what you take in yeah. in taxes oh that's how they do it they're yeah. Billionaires. yeah i don't like the title that we have as a non-profit organization <laughs> <laughs> there's got to be some profit in there somewhere. that's given to you by the internal revenue service so yeah yeah there's different classifications sure yeah, but if they want to hurt you, they can make arrangements to do so. Now, the reason I passed out this uh, bulletin for you. And would encourage you to keep getting a bulletin each Sunday. Is to open it up. And you will see. On page three. Kathy's corner. Now, this is our Kathy is the one responsible for the program. And what she has been doing is writing very, very competent. You know, I'm obviously uh, consider myself to be competent uh, uh, or at least aware of the issues. And I'm telling you that she writes beautiful material because it's very thoughtful. You have to go over it maybe a couple of times and, and kind of catch the, the drift of it. But but she has written these now for about maybe five or six Sundays. You know? and look, look at the work that goes into them. Yeah. yeah I, I wonder if she got it, like, you know, I'd say she had some kind of subscription that no. would provide a book. No, yeah. her, no. Her, yeah, it is. Yeah, you know, her prescription is her, her own. You know, she's very, very uh, highly educated and, uh, and has done all kind of great things for the church and stuff like that. We are so blessed. Our staff here, I, I tell you, and not that previous staffs have any, you know, lessing dimension. They were all wonderful to my judgment. I have not, not come across anybody, but but uh, this staff that we have now is really good. So anyway, and you notice that down at the bottom, she, she, she quotes the various places because she gives, you know, Old Testament references and Matthew references and stuff like that. So 
She doesn't put numbers on them and all that, but she tells you where she got this from. It's from these biblical texts. So in order to do that, she's really got to be, you know, convinced of the beauty of the citizen. Let's just go to the end of the first paragraph there. It says, they, unlike the Sadducees, did not believe that the written Torah was the only source of revelation. And so incorporated the oral tradition of the Hebrew people, interpreting the law according to its spirit. See? So what she's doing there is making the distinction between the uh, Sadducees who uh, do not deviate from the Torah. Everything is, is there in the Torah is to be followed. They're very careful about that. Whereas the Pharisees are kind of like the mediators to take, because there's 613 laws. Well, how are you going to follow all of those and stuff like that? And how do you get forgiveness if you make mistakes? How can you do this, that, the other thing? So that's what the Pharisees are about. And the Pharisees themselves are very good people. We uh, They get kind of a, a bad reputation because of the influence they had uh, in the, the Gospels. But you, you have to be careful that uh, the Gospels also uh, indicate you know, the dimension of Mark's gospel, especially not wanting in Rome to be saying, you know, that uh, the Roman uh, man down there put Jesus to death. Uh, and uh, I'm not saying that he's changing any of the reality of it is, but you got a mixture there because certainly the Pharisees went to the Sadducees and the Sadducees went to the Romans. So you had that connection. I'm not denying that whatsoever, uh, but you just, you know, which are you going to emphasize in your gospel? So... Are the uh, Jews to this day, are they more Sadducees or Pharisees? Well, if you get to, you know, the Hasidim, uh, which is a group that came out of Poland, I believe, in the 1700s, they'd be like our, um, you know, people who live on farms and stuff like that from the 1800s and things, you know, the various groups like that. And so, uh, so it would be very strict. Uh, the Pharisees would be the very, and I'm, I'm, Nothing I would say would be have any diminutive intention, but there are Jews like there are Catholics who are pra not practicing, you know. But they are they would consider themselves Jews by race, but not by faith. Uh, so that it would not drive them to the synagogue. Now I went to the synagogue when I was down in Tucson for a year and a half, trying, uh, uh, not trying, but accomplishing, uh, straightening out, uh, uh, helping our school <laughs> move to a higher level which I did. So anyway, um, uh, the, I, so I went to the synagogue and uh, a lot of young families, it, 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 you know, I, I would say the, that at least more than 50% of the people that were there were families that had little kids. They, at one time, uh, they had uh, a special thing at one of, the, uh, one of their meetings uh, in the synagogue, they had hired a guy from uh, the Croatia or one of those areas to come and write out the Torah for them. Now the Torah, you know, is on spindles like this, and then it's got a covering on it. Then they put it in the ark, is what they call their cabinet, you know. And uh, and so what? Uh, sometimes in their ceremonies, they will take that out of the cabinet, then they'll take it out of the, the top, and then sometimes they come around and people can kiss it or touch it or things like that. And other times they open it up so you can read it. Now, they already had a couple of Torahs, but they wanted a new one. So this man spent two years. He lived there, and he spent two years writing out the Torah. Then when it got down to the end, you know, to the very last. Now, their uh, lineup of the books is different than ours. But when they got to the last book and the last phrase, they took the last sentence, and he, he just took a, a very thin, like a, a pen, uh, you know, or a pin, I should say, and made the outline of letters. Well, I should go this way. No, I should go this way. I got the letters, you know, and, and he would write them out with a, are, am I making sense with a hole in them? In other words, they're, they're, he's writing the word, but it's only uh, in the little outline that you get. So that was so that the rich people uh, who supported this thing could come down and they would dip their thing into the ink and then they would fill in the letter. Like if it was letter A, you know, now that I did letter A or I, you know, G or something like that. So they went through the whole thing, about 12 of them. So each one got to put in a letter. I thought that was really good. So then they had, uh, you know, some a uh, few thoughts and stuff like that. But then they they rolled up the Torah, and uh, then they walked up and down the aisles. And people wanted to touch it because it's a sacred to them. I mean, this is their sacred thing. You can't go to the uh, wailing wall, so but you can touch the Torah, and it was handwritten, like I say. And then uh, the little kids were the most uh, engaging. They had about I'm going to say 40 kids, and they each had a little stuffed doll of a 
Torah. <laughs> Two little spins there, you know, with you know something coming in here, and you're like a Campbell soup can, you know, with the next another Campbell soup can, and and they, then they started to sing Torah, Torah, Torah. <laughs> well, there wasn't a dry eye on the place, you know, because moms and dads are there. Torah, Torah. So they're all passing it on. So that was. I tried to go to their Yom Kippur. Uh, sadly, uh, I got there uh, too late. They said uh, you can't get in. I said, "Well, I, I just would, you know, uh, would, uh, how do I get in?" Well, you go around the back here and you and you pay fifty bucks. You know, that's what the price was. You know, okay. Let's see. That was uh, January and February. You know, right? So uh, for my pay. <laughs> so anyway, uh, so I went in there. And they uh, said, are you a member of the, of the, no, I says, I'm not. And he said, well, this is only for members and for paying members and place was jam packed. So I went out to the car, got some Dunkin' Donuts <laughs> and went home. But I made the effort. They're so finicky about their kosher food and all that. Kind of well, stuff. you see. Yeah, but you know, it depends on what level they're at. It, uh, you know, uh, the mayor of Joliet, well, I was ordained in showing Joliet at St. Mary's Carmelite downtown with another Carmelite, the two of us. And uh, the mayor was Jewish. And the guy who uh, was the parent of, uh, of a man named Novak, who used to write articles in the Washington Post and stuff like that. And uh, he worked for my dad. My dad was an industrialist with a big plant, to eight, 600 people. Anyway, they came to my ordination and sat through it. The mayor, Jewish, mayor of Joliet, Jewish. Yeah. But he was into it. And of course, I, you know, I, our family knew him, not friendly, I mean, but we knew him, so. Are we okay on time? Yeah. Oh, it's, uh, it's 11.15. Once more, right on target. <laughs> Internal clock. Internal clock. Well, thank you very much. Yes, I have two um, movies here. Are, are you interested in either of these? Pardon? Are you interested in either of these? Hey, thank you for joining yeah. us. Yeah, on the lives of the apostles, Peter and Paul, and the Acts. These are discs. Thank you, too. You have a, you have, you have a, have a good day. Uh, you, too. So if anybody wants to uh, take a look at you, you can return when you finish. But um, so if anybody wants them, I'll put them up on the table here. I have others, so I... Uh,